So the aim of the project has been to try to take techniques for, that programmers use for building secure software that have either been proven in some way in academia or are used in industry uh, and to build implementations of them in open source compilers like LLVM and GCC, uh, get those upstream where possible. Um, it's a project that's being carried out by Embicosm alone with funding from Innovate UK. Um, so there's two areas that we're looking at. Um, one is automation and the other is warnings. So uh, when we talk about automation, we mean um, doing things for the programmer that they might otherwise have to do manually or they might find difficult to do manually without help from the compiler. Um, when we talk about warnings, um, there's, there's lots of warnings already in the compiler. Um, we're thinking about can we augment some of those, uh, augment that with some other security specific warnings. Um, and um, the main focus of the project, because we work in a space where um, lots of our customers use embedded systems, IoT, um, those are the kind of targets that we're mainly interested in, um, but not limited to them. Um, so the project, um, it kind of fits in with an academic and industrial context of the work that we do. So on the academic side, we're also in, involved in the uh, leakage aware design automation projects at Bristol University. So when we talk about leakage here, um, Oh, sorry. That, that, the, the aim of that project is to uh, develop designs for tools that allow programmers to build leakage-aware designs. Uh, so when we talk about leakage, that's um, things like uh, timing side channels or electromagnetic side channels that can allow an attacker to learn something about what a system's doing. Um, on the industrial side, um, we've in the past implemented uh, features in the compiler tool chain to support hardware security features. Uh, so at the, I think 2016 uh, LLVM developer meeting, Simon gave a talk about uh, one of those features in the past um, to do with um, trying to present, uh, prevent uh, attacks that int introduce unintended control flow edges. Um, oh, okay, so the projector's vacated, but I think I need to just carry on. Um, so, uh, sorry, the screen I can see is down there. Uh, so. Several, yeah, so several different techniques throughout the course of the project. Um, these are stack arrays and register arrays. Um, so those, those are techniques for um, clearing secret data from memory once it's been um, used in the hope that it will avoid it uh, from being leaked at some point in the future. Uh, sensitive control flow is a warning um, type mechanism to help programmers avoid introducing timing side channels into their programs by... Um, telling them if uh, they create any control flow, if, if uh, any sensitive variables are being used to control control flow in programs. Um, another technique is defensive stores, which is um, intended to try to protect against glitch attacks that would change the value of a variable through some external means. Um, bit slicing is a technique for um, uh, uh, Sorry, it's really thrown me the projector. <laughs> oh, it's a, tra it's a transformation of an algorithm uh, into a sort of Boolean circuit representation. Uh, it's often used in cryptographic algorithms for either to um, take out timing side channels or sometimes for increasing performance as well. And control flow balancing is another, is another technique that tries to remove uh, side channels, ti a timing side channel from a program by making all the branches in a program, or at least in a, a region, take approximately the same amount of time. <laughs> um, what all these different techniques have in common is that conceptually they're quite simple. The trouble is, um, when you come to look at implementing them, is it's quite difficult to um, make a set of implementation choices that result in something that's widely applicable and not too restrictive or doesn't allow people to shoot themselves in the foot too, too easily or isn't useless in some other way. Um, what I actually want to spend the rest of the talk talking about is uh, stack arrays because that's a, t uh, a technique that we've implemented in GCC um, that we'd like to submit. 
uh, a patch for. Um, so I'd like to sort of present it and just gather what feedback I can while we're here. Uh, oh, so um, imagine there's some code on a slide. <laughs> and <laughs> so let, uh, let's say you have a function that takes some, some value and it encrypts that value and then it returns the encrypted value. The value, the unencrypted value, uh, you are worried about it being leaked uh, at some point in the... Uh, oh, it's back. Great. <laughs> so the, uh, this function mangle takes a variable k and then it returns the encrypted version of k. Um, when the pro when this uh, uh, main uh, calls, calls the mangle function. <coughs> uh, so um, in the middle is what the stack looks like during the execution. So main's uh, running, then it calls mangle with uh, the secret value of k, k executes, sorry, mangle executes, and then um, after it's returned, all the values that it was using are still there in memory, even though the stack frame is dead. Uh, so we can, so um, although, although, although those values are dead, we, we can still read them. For in this example, um, if we're inside main, we might um, use an offset from a variable that we have in main to access the unencrypted value of k that was left around. Um, so this is a kind of a trivial example uh, in a way, but the general case of this problem is that you're worried about some attacker at some point later in the program being able to access arbitrary memory and um, read out some of those secret values. So what can you do about this uh, as a programmer? Uh, one thing you might try to do is write some code that overwrites the values of those uh, variables that you're worried about um, just before, say, just before the mangle function exits, but that's going to be quite difficult to achieve successfully because an, op an optimizing compiler is going to work, um, try to remove uh, those writes to variables that it's going to see as not being accessed again later anyway. Even if you found a way to do that, you're probably going to constantly be having to think about how you can verify that that's still working. Um, at least that's, th this seems to be the situation, C and C++. In Ada, uh, someone's found a kind of workaround for implementing a type that always does get erased using a combination of limited private types and inspection points. But it's not sort of a zero overhead, there's some effort you have to go to to be able to do that for the variables that you're interested in. Um, so what we think the right way to do uh, around this instead is to add support in the compiler for making a function erase its stack after it's returned. Uh, so then, instead of all the uh, values being left in memory, we just have a set of zeros, say. Uh, so um, that's it. That's it in theory. Um, for conceptually, fairly simple. Um, what do we want out of an actual implementation that we might uh, try to uh, build and implement in GCC? So this. All right. So this, this is our wish list, or the set of requirements uh, that I think an implementation should satisfy. So it should be widely applicable and usable. What I mean by that is it shouldn't place uh, too many requirements or restrictions on the environment uh, in which a program running can make use of the stack arrays feature. Um, there shouldn't be restrictions on its use in terms of the language features that you can use with it as well. Um, so um, uh, one way of... Uh, one way that I could phrase that is to say that you should be able to use the um, stack arrays in conjunction with most C and C++ features. Um, it should be easy to use in terms of um, making, making it straightforward for the user to enable the feature and then making sure that there aren't situations in which the user can easily think that they're using the feature or using it correctly when in fact they're not using it correctly and not getting stack arrays happening when when, when, when they think it is, so no, kind of not lulling them into a false sense of security. Finally, we want it to be robust, so well tested, so that we know um, or have reasonable confidence that 
when we think it's working, it is working because um, usually uh, when a security feature fails, you find out at the worst possible moment. Um, and we don't want that to be the case here. Uh, so, uh, Any time is a good time for questions. A few questions. Uh, uh, it, did you consider uh, adding that attribute, applying the attribute to variables rather than to the entire stack? And are you concerned with uh, leaking registers, for example, as opposed to simply leaking uh, stack memory? Hello. So, um, uh, so um, we haven't implemented uh, erasing re registers yet, just erasing the stack. Um, the reason for that is that the undead stack values can be much longer lived than just uh, than register values, and um, getting access to read arbitrary memory. Um, kind of allows an attacker a much wider range of things they can read and it seems to be a kind of more common exploit scenario as far as I can determine. So it's something that you would want to consider eventually but something that we just haven't done so far in GCC. And, and a follow up question, how does, it, how does the feature um, interact with inlining? Uh, if you put the stack arrays attribute on a function then that function won't be inlined because there's no partly because there's no epilogue to insert the erasing into. Then you might say, oh, well, let's push the erasing out to the calling function. But that kind of violates the user's expectation because you might be, you might say, you might make this function stack erase and then the next callee is something that you wanted to, like, you might consider it high risk. Um, so you wanted to protect it from, or an exploit in it, from being able to read the old stack frame of the other function. So. We just um, we just we just disable inlining for stack erase functions. If you add attribute always inline, then it, it just throws an error in the same way as the other situations when you put that always inline attribute on and it can't. You probably saw the discussion that Zach Weinberg started on this question on the GCC mailing list three years ago, so asking for a feature like this. So it's good that someone's implemented this sort of thing now. So we added the explicit B0 function to GLibc. To, this is, that's for the particular sub-bit of the problem. We want to erase this thing, and we don't want the compiler to notice it's a web set of something that's disappearing. And so in the GLibc manual, we ended up with a sentence saying that future compilers would recognize calls to explicit B0 to indicate that all the copies, of, all the copies that might have been made on the stack of that data will be erased. Did you implement recognizing calls to explicit B0? Uh, no, no, we didn't. <laughs> but it, that might be a useful thing. We ended up with explicit B0 after looking at, say, this was some BSDs. Have we looked at that and web set S and whatever variant functions that all have the intended idea of erase this data, erase this data without the compiler being able to say, oh, it's amazing something that's going out of scope anyway. So recognizing calls to function looks like that as in indicating the programmer intent could be a useful thing to do. Yeah, the other thing I should mention is that mailing list thread from three years ago that you reference, I'm pretty sure I haven't seen, so I should have a look at that. On the GCC mailing list started three years ago today. All right, okay. Uh, I think Nick had a question. Um, you're probably about to answer this question anyway, but what happens if the protected function has a dynamic stack? It uses C uh, alloc. Okay. So, um, if it has a dynamic stack, then there's, um, I think the function's called emit stack restore or something like that. We may insert a call to generate code to erase the stack just there. Um, but did I interpret the question correctly? Uh, uh, you haven't actually gotten into how you uh, erase the, the stack up at the end of the function, so, but I was anticipating that there might be problems if you don't know the size of the stack. Ah, yeah, so um, you do know how much you're moving the stack pointer up by when you are restoring the stack pointer at runtime. So the stack arrays loop 
is also running at runtime, so it has access to that. Um, so um, just to, to, yeah, to try and get back on track, um, just talked about the wish list. What are the implementation choices you could make when you want to implement something like this? So to go through this, um, there's a nice paper that's been written uh, with a nice name as well. What you get is what you see um, by Laurent Simon, uh, David Chisholm, and Ross Anderson at Cambridge. And the premise of their paper is that um, security engineers have to fight with the C compiler a lot. So there's things that it should do to help them out. And they explore implementations of a couple of different techniques um, to do that. Um, one of which is a combination of stack arrays and register arrays. So they look at some different ways that you could implement it. Three different ways, in fact. So the first way is uh, what they call function-based, where if you annotate a function with the stack arrays attribute, then um, just before that function returns in the epilogue, a loop will run that, it, that um, erases uh, the stack frame. If you apply that attribute to uh, a function, then it's also the case that all of its callees are going to need to erase their stack as well, because they might be past some of the data that you were worried about protecting in the, in the function that you annotated. The problem with doing that is that if all the callees are erasing their stack, there's kind of a lot of redundant work being done, because they're going to be erasing the, the same um, area of stack over and over again. Um, so to quantify what that overhead is going to be, they took the MyBench benchmarks and uh, compiled them um, with a modified toolchain such that all of the functions erase their stack at return uh, all the time, and all the libc functions that they called as well, and then uh, benchmarked it to see how much longer it takes to execute them compared to if you don't do that. And um, so the overhead for this function-based method um, is uh, basically it seems to double the execution time. That sounds painful, but I, act I actually don't think that's too bad. Um, partly because you wouldn't normally apply the stack arrays attribute to every single function in a program, just a subset of them that you're um, interested in. And secondly, um, if you are considerably concerned about uh, leaking these secrets, maybe doubling your execution time is not such a huge penalty. I guess it, opinions may vary on that. Anyway, in the paper, um, this um, is considered a concern. So they look at other methods that they could use to uh, reduce the overhead of the method. So the next method that they call stack-based uh, is where an when an, only when an annotated function returns does it do the stack erasing. And it does these stack arrays for all of its callees as well. And the way in which it knows exactly how much stack to array is what, all of what's been used by all of its callees is um, through tracking. Um, so they had a new variable called stack point to libc. And then when every function uh, exits, it will increase this stack point variable in line with how much stack it might have used. Um, then uh, after all, uh, then at the point at which the uh, stack arrays annotated function exits, um, it can erase all the way between the current stack pointer and whatever the maximum stack usage has been for all of its callees. Did that make sense? Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. All right, yeah. So there is still some overhead in this because every single function that's executing is always going to be tracking its stack usage because it doesn't really know whether it's called by a stack arrays function or not. So you can never, um, you can never not do it. So, so they look for um, another way uh, or a way to reduce that overhead a bit further. And this is the call graph based method. So in this method, um, there's no runtime tracking. The, any, any annotated function will um, have the extent of the stack size that it needs to erase hard coded into it. The only way you can do that is if the compiler can see all of the code at compile time. So this is kind of an applicable um, thing to do if you're compiling something, say, for a small embedded system. But it's more difficult to do if you're, say, using any library code or the compiler can't see any of the code. Um,
So, for example, uh, if the um, function h um, were annotated to stack erase, then the compiler would have to use the call graph and the uh, information about the stack usage of the functions k and l to work out exactly what the hard-coded amount of stack to erase should be. Uh, there's a question again. Surely that's not going to work if you've got function pointers, because you can't predict. Yes, so you would have to make it like a compile error to have function point. Well, yeah, you, you yes. Um, also, it's uh, a bit of a problem if you have recursion as well. So it, you can handle bounded recursion as long as the compiler can tell what's going on, in, in theory, um, I guess. Um, yeah, but in general, yeah, it's quite a restrictive. Like, there's no overhead apart from the actual erasing of the stack in the function at mark stack arrays, but it's quite restrictive. Um, so this is just a comparison overview of the, of the three techniques. To me, um, for a general implementation, function-based is quite attractive because it's sort of a straightforward implementation, but it is slower than the other two. The other two feel a bit less attractive because of these restrictions that you have to have and kind of a dependence in, in the environment in which they run. There is also, uh, so this is a table from the analysis in the paper. Um, there's various things that they analyze about these, but there's just a couple that I wanted to uh, talk that we've already talked about. So cycles in the call graph uh, not being able to be handled uh, recursion by the call graph based method and uh, variable size stack objects as well. So um, in the paper they conclude that none of these methods can handle variable size stack objects. But um, as I was mentioning earlier, I do think you can handle variable size, size stack objects because when uh, you um, exit the scope in which a variable size stack object was. You can just do the stack erasing at the same point the stack pointer is restored. Um, all right, okay, so this just lays out um, some of, again, some of which I've already talked about, but all the choices that we've specifically made for the implementation. Um, so we've gone with the function-based method because the other two um, need uh, either something in the environment or need access to the whole program source. There is one dependency on the environment that using the function-based method can have, and that's um, if you happen to hope that your stack will be erased um, in a stack erase function, but you jump through it, or sort of jump, if you use long jump to return to an earlier point, then that's going to skip the stack erasing. So you could um, modify your long jump implementation to erase all the stack between uh, the old stack pointer and the new stack pointer, but if you uh, care about that, you probably just shouldn't use long jump. Um, yeah, lots of people looking at me like I'm mad, but okay. Uh, uh, say again. If, if the user has requested that the function, this function has stack erasing and there's a long jump within it, issue an error on that long jump and say, I can't do both. You might. Yeah, yeah, you can't catch it, yeah. Uh, Florian? Um, I think C++ exceptions will have the same problem, but there you can patch the unwinder. When you say the same problem, are you th talking about unwinding when there's an exception thrown? Or yes, or? and then you need to, to flag the stack as needing to so be sure. I would have... I initially expected that the problem there would be a similar problem as well, but when I, as far as I could determine, um, uh, emitting the stack restore seems to be used at all. It seems to. Uh, it's not very fresh in my head, but I think th that whenever the stack pointer gets moved during that case if your emit stack restore um, is emitting the stack arrays code as well, then I think that it leads to yes, everything it, being erased as it should be. Yes, you need to change the unwinder. You can, you can fix it, but uh, initially if you don't do it, implement something in the unwinder, I think okay. it, will, it will leave some frames un unerased. 
And I think that's also a way to fix long jump because you can use the unwinder to check if the long jump call is what valid because uh, it goes to a higher stack frame. I think, um, I think we should talk a bit later because I had convinced myself that this was okay. not a problem, but maybe it is. Uh, so where am I? Oh yeah, so because we need to make sure that um, if, if we have a stack arrays function, all of its callees uh, are also stack arrays. That means that we've got to check that um, you've got the stack arrays attribute on every function you call. And sometimes you, you don't always have the, uh, the implementation available. You might just have the header. So to make sure that um, the compiler is always correctly informed about whether a function is stack arrays or not, when you're compiling code, uh, we kind of enforce consistency in using the stack arrays attribute in the prototype and the definition of the function. Um, there's a, uh, I've got an example of that later. Um, oh yeah, so uh, the next point was about um, erase the stack when restoring the stack pointer, which I thought was what was happening when we had an exception in C++ or a variable length object. And we don't inline stack arrays functions for the, the reasons that we talked about a minute ago. Um, the implementations that we've uh, built it for so far are RISC-5 because uh, we care about RISC-5 a lot um, and x86 to um, partly as a demonstration that the uh, target independent parts that we have uh, added uh, are suitable for more than one architecture and x86 because it's quite a widely used architecture so it seems like a sensible um, second target to implement it in. Uh, more choices. Um, we only erase the stack, not the registers, because um, we consider it sm it's something we'd want to do eventually, um, but um, as it's kind of a smaller window of opportunity for an attacker, we've not done it so far. Um, we don't do anything about signal handling, so I'm not... Um, uh, in the paper, they describe um, making uh, additions to the stack arrays implementation to deal with the fact that a signal handler might put some things that happen to be secret um, somewhere else if um, a signal is received during the um, execution of a stack arrays function. Um, so the, the two options that they kind of suggest for this is, one is you could do something about that in the uh, stack arrays implementation in the compiler or you could leave it up to the environment to somehow sort it out. So for simplicity for now, and especially because, say, on a lot of embedded systems, um, there's not going to um, be signals and signal handling. Um, I haven't done anything about that for now. Um, is that kind of... Ah, there is. What do you do about the registers that are saved on the stack? Because then they're, they're that's now memory. So, call these save registers. Uh, do you erase them? And if so, where do you find sorry, some I'm spare just, registers? Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to... Uh, could you repeat the question? What do you do about call these save registers when you go into a function and there are a number of registers that have to be preserved for before returning and restored before returning to the caller? Oh, yeah, we restore the, reg we restore the call, save registers, erase the stack, and then the return instruction is left. So which registers do you do use for your code? Because you may not have any spare. Um, I do, uh, uh, so that situation doesn't seem to have presented itself. Like we do, I, I don't... If you're, returning, if you're returning using all the scratch registers for returning values to the caller, and you've just restored all the call these saved registers, you've got nothing spare for doing the code that does the, risk, the erase. So on RISC-5, um, I believe there's always enough scratch registers available to be able to do that. Uh, we only reuse um, a variable that's already called prolog epilog temp uh, anyway, and it's used for, um, uh, for other purposes within the epilog anyway. Um, Craig has done the implementation on x86 where it might be different. Hey. Um, yeah, so I've chosen, it's either R11 or R10 on x86, which is a caller saved temporary register. And that seems to be not causing any trouble. 
for the x86 implementation. Um, a different register. Uh, I can't remember which one, but it is one of the free caller saved registers. So it's a bit unfair to bring this up for 32-bit uh, 386 because we actually have this problem in GCC today that for some flag combinations we can't generate correct epilogues and prolo prologues and epilogues because we don't have any registers left. So <laughs> that is, it's already a problem with the architecture and uh, if you need more registers then it's only getting Worse, but you can work around it by not using, um, uh, not using certain advanced features like uh, rest register arguments or other unusual APIs. So maybe that's good enough for your purpose. Do you have anything to respond, Craig? <laughs> okay. Um, thanks. Okay. Let's talk afterwards anyway, because uh, we should understand a bit better. Uh, hi. Sorry. I have one question. Um, I was just wondering, what do you base the, the first point on saying that um, uh, register read is, well, you class it as a less of a threat than memory read? Is that just out of experience? You got some, is there some research into that? Or? Uh. Or so, just because they're less? Uh, I guess mm, it's kind of like based on my anecdote. It's it's, it's it, I guess it's sort it's sort of anecdotal. I guess it's sort of based on my anecdotal experience in a sense. Um, I could um, and sort of what feels like it is the case. Uh, I haven't like a hard source to back that up. Okay. Um, but generally, um, if you can overwrite things on the stack, you can overwrite what the inter what is representing the length of some buffer. Um, and as a result of that, if you can overwrite it with a larger value, and that buffer is going to be passed back to, like out of the program in some way, then you can end up getting the program to pass out a lot more bytes than before. Um, it's not clear, uh, and that, that's kind of like a general. Um, situation that can occur in lots of in lots of circumstances because lots of programs have like some small or you know a reasonable number of programs have some small buffer on the stack and then maybe something holding account of something also on the stack um, yeah, okay. so, so it, it's kind of me looking at things and saying this seems like it should be a bigger problem Uh, last slide of choices. Oh, so we always erase the stack with zeros. Um, some that's good enough for most people. Um, some people who are quite who might be concerned about additional threats to their software or hardware might find that that's a bad implementation choice because if you write a sequence of zeros over the stack, it can exactly leak the contents of the stack through an electromagnetic side channel. So what they would much rather do instead is overwrite the stack with random values, which sounds nice, but um, sometimes it can be difficult to get a good enough source of randomness to do that well on an embedded system. You might just be doing more work and convincing yourself you're closing the EM side channel when in fact you're doing more work and not solving the problem. Uh, so because this is quite a s sort of small specific case that's difficult to solve easily on general, in general yeah, on most hardware, um, we've just decided to erase the stack with zeros in instead of trying to fill it with random data. Um, uh, any other questions on the implementation choices at the moment? Okay, um, so um, I mentioned earlier that uh, we um, enforce the user is uh, consistent between the, like the header and the implementation with the stack arrays attribute. If they say don't put the attribute on the f on the prototype. Do put it on the implementation. Then I'll get an error like this that tells them they've used the attribute on the function, but not on the prototype. So 
if they do make these kinds of mistakes, it should be fairly easy to track down. We're not introducing, hopefully we're not introducing something that creates errors that are a pain to work out the source of and debug. Um, the other thing is we talked to, uh, I think there was a mention about function pointers earlier, oh, although it was in a different context. Um, we decided that it's probably better not to allow calling functions through function pointers in stack arrays functions. And the reason for that is because the attribute, um, someone might correct me here if I'm wrong, but I think the attribute is not going to be a part of the type of the function as such, so it'll be easy to lose track of it um, and not really track very well whether a function is stack arrays or not when it's um, being passed around in a function pointer. Um, so we just disallow it. If you try to you call a function uh, through a function pointer in a stack arrays function, you'll get another error. Is that reasonable? It's not unreasonable. Oh. As opposed to a declaration, which would presumably allow this. Okay. Uh, if you wanted to support that use case. talk to you afterwards, if that's all right, because uh, I'm running a little low on time. Oh, okay. Uh, so next, um, I just wanted to, to oh. Uh, um, can you put the attribute on nested functions? I haven't done anything to disallow it, so does that mean the answer is yes? Right, okay. What about function static data? If you have a static variable inside a function, that's, that seems like a, that's technically would be in the BSS or data section, but it kind of is notionally associated with the function as far as a glance. Uh, yeah, um, so it's a good question. And um, I think that that's probably something that has the potential to be misleading to the user. So maybe it's worth a warning if you use a static inside a stack arrays function. Yeah. Does that, would that kind of address a concern that you're thinking of? Yeah, because it, 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 you, if you're not really paying attention, you might miss something. They're, they're very tricky when uh, I find the source of errors. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so testing, because we want uh, stack arrays to be robust. Um, I saw this quote, quote at the Museum of Science and Industry, which to me looks like a quote from the 19th century about so, testing your software. Um, so the way we test stack arrays, um, to test that um, the attribute is actually working is annoys me a little bit. So what we need, what we do at the minute is um, we kind of create a little test harness for it, where um, we have a bit of inline assembler that zeroes out a few kilobytes of stack, records what the stack pointer is, calls the stack arrays function that we want to test, and then we've got another little bit of assembly that makes sure that that function didn't change the stack pointer to something else, or at least restore it to what it was before it entered, and then uh, checks that the stack uh, space that we zeroed out before is still full of zeros. Um, I think this works, but I kind of don't like it because it makes all the stack arrays test target specific, and it would be nice if they weren't. Um, do, do, did you have a question, David? Should it be the initial thing be to be fill it with something non-zero? Um, because you'll verify, you want to verify that the stack clearing has cleared it to zero, and if it's already zero, well, then a no-op would, would fulfill that criteria. Um, I think there's an argument for probably doing it both ways and yeah. seeing what... Um, I, I think there's an argument for doing that, yeah. I think maybe what I was thinking in the very beginning was uh, I'm not ex entirely sure exactly how much stack all my tests are going to use, so I'll just fill enough space with... Like, I'll fill the whole space with zeros so that uh, when I check again, I can expect it all to be zeros again. But it's prob probably it would make the test more robust if uh, I did what you suggest yeah, instead. Initial fill of non-zero, because otherwise if, you've, if you suddenly start failing to zero, then you, you'll get a false um, positive, negative, whatever. Yeah, yeah I guess, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I guess a concern I have, which applies to this as well, is um, 
if I wanted to use this for a large number of tests, I might need to know exactly how much stack they all used. Uh, Nick? The code you have up on there doesn't seem to be zeroing the stack beforehand. It's just incrementing, sorry, decrementing no, the stack. No, sorry, order. it's because of these tiny little dots which encompass oh. the code that actually zeroes the stack. Sorry, I, I didn't think it would be too readable uh, if I put the whole lot on this. Uh, I think manipulating the stack pointer this way will be quite risky because the optimizers from GCC can do things to your function that will break it and uh, for at least for non-embedded targets you usually have something like uh, p-threads where you can supply your own stack allocation and then you can inspect that more directly and uh, or use set context and make context to supply your own stack so that you can can inspect the contents more directly and uh, avoid these kind of stack pointer manipulations in your test code. Okay. Uh, so, all oh right, yeah. So that gives us a way to test a, few, a small number of uh, tests of code that we might write that has the stack arrays attribute, um, and that uh, we know with some certain effort right in a enough test cases, we can start to convince ourselves that maybe it works. Uh, <laughs> hi, Nick. In the example you gave us previously, it's quite likely that um, the fun test function would never actually put anything on the stack. It only had a couple of parameters. So you, you can't actually be sure that stack erasing has happened. It may not, funk may not use any stack. If it doesn't use any stack. You want to be sure that if Funk has stored something on the stack that it gets erased. Yes. But if Funk, because it's so small and trivial, it may not use any stack. So the stack erasing may not have happened. But then, if there's a bug in the implementation that means stack erasing doesn't work, you won't detect it because Funk never uses it. But we would have other tests that do have make use of the stack. Okay. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm saying you, you ought to be, you need to be assured that Funk has used the stack in order for this test to be of value. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I guess uh, David's suggestion of using something non-zero instead of filling it with zeros kind of starts to address, address that. Uh, so, that anyway, that gives us a few tests. What we'd like is a much larger corpus of tests that we can use with stack arrays to check that when we use stack arrays with lots of different C and C++ features, it um, actually does erase the stack correctly. Or that if we use stack arrays with them, it doesn't break those features. So, um, what we try to do is use the entire GCC, C and C++ test suites in, uh, as tests of stack arrays. And the way we do that um, is we've added a configure flag, enable default stack arrays. So when you build GCC with that, um, it will always have stack arrays turned on for every single function that it compiles. And then um, we modify underscore start so that it does a similar thing to the code that I just saw showed in the uh, previous slide where it will zero out some stack space or maybe do something different if we follow David's suggestion. Then it will call main and then do the check after main has returned. Uh, then if we run the, the whole GCC, C and C++ test suites, if any tests fail, um, oh, sorry, if, the, it, it, yeah, it, if any tests fail, then we know that either having the implementation of stack arrays on any of the functions um, has somehow broken their implementation or uh, perhaps it resulted in the stack not being erased. Um, Oh yeah, so um, on risk 5 at least most of the tests worked when I did that apart from the set of tests that used long jump because uh, that was skipping arrays in the stack. So um, for running this test I modified uh, on risk 5 modified long jump to array stack as well. Um, so this is um, what those tests uh, test results look like. So in the middle column it's just the uh, trunk that I took at some point and then ran the test suite on, then applied the patch to add stack arrays, uh, configured with enable default stack arrays again, and, and like ran the test suite again. Um, there's a bunch of new passes because the patch added uh, a bunch of tests of stack arrays. Um, 
the sudden addition of uh, some unsupported tests that are to do with atomics. Um, I'm showing these numbers in the spirit of honesty because this is what I saw, but I'm pretty sure that there was just something up with my testing environment at the time I ran this that resulted in that, because otherwise it would be a bit weird. Um, we, what we don't get uh, is any new failures. So although it's not a complete proof that stack arrays is always erasing everything for every function, it kind of raises, it's, a, it's sort of a start, it raises my level of confidence that um, it is working in most cases, and also that it's not breaking any of the features that are tested by the C and C++ test suites. Uh, any questions? Peter? Just wondering if that, if you've got stack arrays on every single function call, then knowing that it's finally erased all the stack isn't really testing all the intermediate calls, is it? Because they may or may not have cleared out their stack as long as the last one did, then all is well. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, the, that's the limitation of this. I don't know what's going on in the middle of any test case. I only know what the state appears to be right at the end. Um, yeah. Uh, on x86, um, so the results that are presented here, these are from running with enable default stack arrays on, but I haven't modified, this is without uh, having a, a modified underscore start. Um, so this is just testing that when you turn stack arrays on, it doesn't break any of the tests. It's, it, this, um, we still need to um, come up with a set of results that is actually checking the stack arrays on x86. Um, what we do see though, um, which I'm showing this now because I think it's worth worth sort of pointing, uh, well, worth discussing. Um, there are a bunch of new fails on x86, and a lot of those are because of uh, tests that scan the assembler for certain things, and their passing conditions don't hold when you start emitting stack arrays um, code that was unexpected in a lot of these tests. Um, one or two of the fails uh, are not for that reason, but they're execution tests. What they have in common is um, uh, what they seem to have in common is that they use var args, so maybe there's something to do with var args that's not quite right with the implementation as it is right now. Um, and then some of the tests make the assumption that dead stack values don't change, which is obviously going to be untrue in uh, a situation where you're always erasing this, those dead stack values. Uh, any questions or comments? Okay, it's nearly three o'clock. I wonder if you consider non-contiguous stacks, particularly, it seems to me that long jump, uh, the decision to erase between old and new SPs will not quite work. Yeah, so we're, um, we haven't done anything to do with uh, non-contiguous stacks. Um, so I did have a little bit of a look at um, what a non-contiguous stack was. Uh, at some point recently, and I kind of convinced myself that it's not something that's uh, in common use. Is that a correct assessment? I somehow got the idea that it's used in Go, but I'm not sure. I mean, I don't really know. Okay. So, uh, I mean, at the minute, if you have a non-contiguous stack and you use stack arrays, I think probably just bad things are going to happen. Apart from Go split stacks, you've also got SIGOR stack to use a different stack for your signal handler. That could. But I don't think you should be long jumping out of that onto a different stack. Okay. Um, so, so, uh, uh, but, but in relation to the signal handlers, we decided um, not to sort of do anything about signal handling. But perhaps. Um, also, also, this is not about like things getting put somewhere else in the presence of a signal handler, but SIGOLT stack is a signal that changes the location of the stack? Yes, so the signal okay. handler runs with a different stack, in case the signal is because the stack space was exhausted, for example. Okay. Uh, right. Um, yeah, I think, I think so far the work we've done is just... Uh, um, kind of doesn't take that into account. Um, so, so, C 
check out stack is kind of interesting. Would that maybe be uh, an alternative implementation that you um, say this is a function I don't really trust with <laughs> this input and so here you get a 4K stack and you have to do everything in that and then we erase the stack at the end. Is that the, or is that a completely stupid idea? <laughs> I don't know is the answer. Um, oh, I don't think I can. I don't think I can answer off the top of my head. Well, it 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 it, it would not allow you to make deep deep call chains. But I'm I'm not completely sure if uh, functions with uh, stack erase would do something like that anyway. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I think, I, I think we, yeah, uh, sorry, I don't know. Um, as I was saying, I think it's nearly three o'clock and I'm sure everybody would love to get home. So rather than going through this whole demo application that we tried it out with, basically we wanted to do a bit of experimentation with the feature that wasn't just inside a test suite. So we had a vulnerable application that, le um, that left some secret data on the stack, uh, developed an exploit for it. And then, um, the, so the exploit uh, would cause you to be able to read um, a secret value from um, an old stack frame on an attacking machine. And uh, to, um, I suppose the, conclu the, the end of the story is that by adding the stack arrays attribute to one of the functions that was leaving the secret value around, this is this, it was actually a C++ function in the Arduino IDE, uh, adding stack arrays to the header and the um, implementation of, of the function um, by recompiling that the exploit that we had no longer worked. Um, there is a, a blog post on the MBCosm blog that goes th um, into that tells that story a lot better than I can um, with ten seconds to go. So. Um, Hopefully we're moving towards an implementation that we can use in a lot of different environments that doesn't restrict how you can use the language, um, that's easy for the user to use, both turning on and not um, doing themselves an injury by um, using it incorrectly, uh, and that they can have faith in works. Um, so I wrote patch to be submitted ASAP on the bottom, but perhaps uh, conversations to be had, thoughts to be had, revisions to be made patch to be submitted ASAP instead. Thank you. Um, so uh, the Linux kernel is, is also interested in, in that kind of functionality. And on the kernel side, the project is called the Stack Leak project. Uh, they have an implementation for x86 and an iArch64 implementation is either finished or in progress. Uh, did you have a chance to look at that? Uh, I'm afraid I didn't, but I will do. Uh, because it might be, uh, like, if you, is it, it might be useful to coordinate this on the GCC side if the, the this is to to be this is to appear in GCC trunk, because the Linux kernel is using a GCC plugin right now. Uh, so so uh, I'm not sure. Why would it be difficult to coordinate? No, it should not be difficult. It just oh, sorry. Good. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I believe we have less than two months before feature freeze of GCC nine. So, um, do you see that the patch, the patch is hopefully going to be on the mailing list soon? <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I'd like to get it done as soon as possible. Um, uh, I, th I, th I mean, I think one thing I would want to be wary of is um, upon acceptance saying, there you go, there, it's done. It does worry me a little bit that as a new feature there might be bugs that would be te to be teased out and um, I wouldn't want to be too um, sort of forward in saying this will make you safe um, if you just use it um, if there's some way to, uh, to sort of communicate that.
And you should include Zach and the other people from the 2015 discussion in the patch posting along with whatever Linux kernel people are involved in this sort of area. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, perhaps a bit obvious, but I think you should be prepared for uh, those architectures where there are just a few registers available at the end of the function that maybe you want to add a target specific hook for them instead of open coding the stack clearing and sorry I'm still clearing. Clear. Maybe we want to add a I uh, a target specific hook for what? So to let the the target deal with the target specific code deal with register clearing and stack clearing instead of open coding it in somewhere within the middle end, so to speak. So we do add a, a target hook for that. Um, oh, okay, uh, very good, thank but, you. But, but you still need to modify the um, like expand epilogue function in the target anyway. Because ah, Good, great, thank you. I, I don't think there's a, a, a generic way in which you could insert that because they're all different anyway. Yeah, people may think there is a generic way. But yeah. <laughs> okay, great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I didn't really talk about the content of the patch at all, uh, mainly because I think that as a sort of set of coding changes, it's probably n not um, particularly involved or controversial, where I think all the interesting discussion is really is in the set of choices that we made and the testing that we've done instead, rather than, you know, there's, n there's no big fundamental change to anything in GCC to implement this. Uh, someone was mentioning that uh, the test that you showed only tests at the end. Um, yeah. There's a GCC flag called F instrument functions. I don't know, uh, maybe it can be used to test at the end of every, uh, every call returning because you can uh, write a hook there. If that uh, does what it sounds like, then that would probably be quite valuable for I'm not, for I'm not sure yeah. like exactly, but there is, there, is a, there is F instrument functions and then you need to uh, like uh, implement one or two functions that are called at the entry and exit to, to check. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that because that does sound like it would help with that. 